So now I'm going to jump into quantum physics. Okay. Thanks. Okay. But by the way, I love this stuff. This was my major. You know, I kind of think this stuff is cool. So um, pardon me. <laughs> but don't worry, because I take all my inspiration. Uh, remember, Einstein did most of his work when he was in his early 20s. Although I don't get most of my inspiration from that Einstein, I get it mostly from this one, right? So we're going to go on from there. So here's, here's a conceptual exercise, right? We're going to stay on this for just a moment, just to get the concept of how quantum stuff is so weird, OK? So I'm going to start animating this. Now, I'm going to begin. Look at A as one example. Think of it as being a ball that's confined in a space, and it's bouncing between the walls of that space, OK? Just an idea. So the ball can have continuously varying location and speed. We can know where it is, how it fast it's moving. It can move a little bit faster, a little bit faster. We, we understand that intuitively, right? But when you get to the quantum level, where you're down to you know, super small spaces, it turns out that matter starts behaving differently. For example, an electron has only discrete energy states and is confined to certain locations. That's different than the ball. The electron just can't increase its energy a bit, a bit. If it's in a confined space, like an orbital, like around an electron, if it's confined to the space, it has confined energy states. So look at B as an example and think of like flipping a rope, right? You've got it connected at one end and, or think of it as a string on a guitar or whatever. You pluck it and that it's confined at both ends, like this electron is going to be confined within an orbital space. And it has this mode of vibration. So it's got this one certain mode of energy. Think of that line as indicating a certain amount of energy. If you want to increase its energy, you can't just increase it a little bit. It's got to jump to C. It goes to a bimodal vibration. And if you want to increase its energy again, it can't just gradually go up. It's got to jump to D, where it's got a trimodal vibration pattern. So B, C, and D are indications. It's just a, a diagramic idea of the fact that the energy levels are discrete. They can't just continuously get bigger and bigger. They can only jump, boop, 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 which is really weird. It's fundamentally objectionable, right? It's like, how can that be? How come you can't go from one energy level to another? What about in between? Well, it turns out in the quantum world, you make the jump. There is no in between. And we're going to get to that further by not studying equations like that, but by looking at things physically. And I'm going to show you an example of how we know this is really true. This would be the spectrum of light that we get from the sun. So a whole bunch of elements are there. They're crashing into each other. And we get a full spread of visible. There's also ultraviolet infrared radiation as well. This is what you know, our eyeballs happen to capture. But if you were to heat up some hydrogen gas, okay, which is a simple element, it's just a Proton and electron, right? It's the simplest element you can get. So it's going to show us the quantum effects pretty simply. If you were to heat it up and look at the light that you get, this is what you get. Boop. That's it. Now, there are some wavelengths in the ultraviolet that we can't see and some in the infrared. This is what you get in the visible. But you only get these four. That's it. There are no in-betweens. That's reality. I mean, macroscopically, you heat up hydrogen. This is the colors you're going to see. It's real. But how, what's going on? How come there's only four? Well, that's because of the discrete energy levels of the orbitals of the electrons around that hydrogen uh, nucleus. It's just the quantized energy levels that are available. Now, I'm going to take this into a crystal state. I'm going to talk about silicon and crystal. I'm going to talk about energy bands in a crystal. What does that mean? What's an energy band? Well, vertically, I hear I draw energy. So we go up. If you're thinking up, we're thinking more and more energy. If I think about an isolated electron, just all by itself, just you know, with electrons confined to their orbitals around that nucleus of that silicon atom, it turns out that the outermost electrons only have these two energy levels that they can emit light from, okay, or that they can occupy. That's the energy levels they can be. It's either those two or that's it. But if I start to put a bunch of atoms together, bringing them together, imagine them coming together so that these orbitals start to overlap and interlock and intermesh with each other, and the physics starts getting mushed between all of them together, it turns out that what happens is those energy discrete states 
start becoming filled, 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 filled with billions and trillions and trillions of electrons, none of which can have exactly the same energy levels. They all have to be kind of next to each other. And it just turns out that they start to create bands of energy. A lower state of energy is called the valence band and an upper state is called the conduction band. So what happens is that at rest, the valence bands are filled, the, all the energy levels that are possible are filled with electrons. At the conduction band is where they could be, but they're typically not there uh, because silicon is not a good conductor. Uh, we're gonna get to how they get there in a minute, but these are the energy bands that get created by putting a bunch of silicon atoms with orbitals next to each other. This is gonna be a critical concept. And in between is this band gap. And what does that mean? That means that you have energy levels there that cannot be occupied. <laughs> you either are an electron in the valence band or you get enough energy boop, and you jump up to the conduction band. You can't just sit in the, in the band gap. The difference here is, for example, if I was to show this picture for copper, the conduction band is dropped down and actually intersects with and is a part of the valence band. And so an electron has no gap. It can simply be around a copper atom or whoop, it can just start wandering in the conduction band and be pushed along with some voltage and conduct current like we have in a copper wire. And that's great. That's what makes a conductor. And you can have materials that have a band gap that are super wider, two, three, four times wider than this. That would be like an insulator where the energy needed to go from the bound valence band state for an electron to be able to become free is so great that it just never happens. No matter how much voltage you put on it, you can't break it free. And that is what we call an insulator. But semiconductors are great because they've got a band gap that it turns out, it just turns out, the band gap energy matches the energy that we get from the sun. And that's the magic that we're gonna take advantage of. And I'm gonna show you that. So let's keep going with this idea of energy band gaps in crystal and silicon. On the left, I've drawn that picture and I've filled it in with some black dots that represent electrons that are in that valence band. So remember the valence band is the band of energy where the electrons are stuck. So think of these as being the electrons that are in those bonds that connect silicon to silicon and they're just orbiting between the silicon atoms and they're stuck, but they're holding it all together, okay? And conduction would be those free electrons or those free holes would be the free electrons that are able to move around, okay? So it turns out just nature just gives us silicon with a band gap of 1.1 electron volts, 1.1 volts for an electron. It's just that way. And there's other materials that have other band gaps, but all semiconductor materials are gonna be roughly around this level. So let's, let's look at this. The drawing that I have on the right shows the spectrum of light that we get from the sun with the horizontal axis being the photon energy, electron volts. It's not the usual way you see this. Usually it's with wavelength, but this is with energy. And then this is vertical is the amount. So this, this black line represents all the light, all the energy that we get from the sun. I show the visible right here. And here's the 1.1. So the idea is that if light, if a photon of light has 1.1 electron volts or more, then it has enough energy to knock that electron loose. Let's look at that. The photon would come in, strike an electron that's bound, but now it would have enough energy to break it free, and that's that idea of that electron being ionized and able to move around. I'm showing it here in a different way. I showed it before in sort of a physical way. This is kind of in a band gap way, but it's the same idea. So the electron that got knocked loose is now in the conduction band, and this electron is the one that can move around. And what it left behind was a hole. And this hole is the hole that can wander around as well, right? So we've created the whole electron pair of charged carriers that can move around. And that's because in this case, I looked at a photon of light that had at least 1.1 electron volts or more, which means everywhere from this region of the infrared into the red, orange, yellow, blue, violet colors, and here into the near uh, ultra, uh, ultraviolet. All of these guys have enough or more energy to knock that electron loose. That's how we get solar cells to work in the first place. Now, a critical thing I'm gonna introduce here, just to, to mention, is this is one of the reasons why solar cells are not 100% efficient. 
this is one of the beginnings of the sources of the loss of efficiency. Because if, see, all of the light on the other side of the green line here, all of this light does not have enough energy. It has less than 1.1. And that's the all or nothing idea of, of quantum physics. If the light comes in and it doesn't have 1.1, it can't elevate the electron part way. It can't do it at all. And it just goes through. And so these low energy, long wavelength infrared lights, super long infrared light, can actually go right through a solar cell because they don't have enough energy to in interact, and so they don't. So that's one of the sources, and we lose a lot of incoming light that we maybe could use, but we can't because it doesn't have enough energy, okay? So now, this is gonna get a little mind blowing, okay? I'm gonna literally bend your mind here for a minute, so just hang on. If this gets a little confusing, don't worry. It's gonna get clear, but hang on, okay? So I'm redrawing my picture here of intrinsic silicon. Now, I'm gonna draw a line in the middle, and I'm gonna label it, label it the Fermi energy level, EF, whatever, just a term that I'm gonna use. And think of this as kind of being the average um, measure of the states available for electrons. There's half as many states down here as there are up here. It's right in the middle of intrinsic silicon. Intrinsic silicon means it's undoped. It's just pure silicon, okay? This, this line is kind of like saying that the average American family has 2.2 kids, right? You don't have 0.2 kids, right? It's just a mathematical number. This guy, even though it's in the forbidden region here, it's the mathematical average point between the number of states that are available down here and the number of states that are available up here. Well, let's keep going. Let's remember about p-type silicon, right? How did this mess this up? Well, remember our p-type silicon is where we had the boron, which introduced those spots where electrons could go. Remember that? Okay. This is what it looks like in this diagram. This is another way of looking at it from a band gap diagram. These would be the boron sites right here. And you go, wait, dude, you just said that I can't put stuff in the, in the forbidden zone. What's going on? Okay, that was for pure silicon. This is messed up silicon. This is silicon that's been doped. So I've physically, I've mechanically put these atoms in place and I've created these energy states in what was intrinsic silicon, but now I've made these states. And this is what happens. Remember, I can get electrons that are nearby those boron atoms to just boop, jump up and fill those vacancies that were created in those boron sites. And now these electrons get stuck there forever, right? And they left behind holes, which now can move around. That was the picture that I drew before, but now I'm just looking at it from a different point of view. But now what's happened is that I've created a whole bunch more possible states down at this low energy level thing. So my, my average energy level, my Fermi level, my average energy level has been lowered down and I draw it way down here. I'm gonna keep going. What about the N type stuff that's at the front of the cell? Remember that? That was where I had phosphorus atoms that had those fifth electrons that pretty easily could just break away and move free. Well now, let's look at that from this point of view. What do you think that's gonna look like? It's gonna look like this. So now these are actually introducing those phosphorus sites. I've mechanically put them in place. I've messed up what was my pure intrinsic silicon and I've put them in place here. And now these guys have energy levels that are so close to the Gushkin band. Remember, those electrons just could vibrate easily and break free and that's exactly what they do. So these would be representing those electrons that break free from the phosphorus and can just start wandering around. And that's what the conduction band means. That's the band of energies that means I have enough energy to just be able to wander free. And it leaves behind those phosphorus sites that are permanently in place there. Those are those representation of those phosphorus atom sites as well. And what that does is that says, hey, I've introduced a whole bunch more possible states up here than down here. So I'm gonna move my average line up. So it's up here now. Now, the reason that we're doing this is to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm building. See, I'm building all the way. Trust me, I'm building. These energy levels, the, the average energy level has to be the same if I put these guys together. If they're physically built together, which they are, when I make a cell, I build the n-type on top of the p-type. If they're physically together at equilibrium, at thermodynamic equilibrium, the average has to be average across both regions. 
And so what's happened is that the bands bend. This is kind of weird, okay? But the bands are drawn. I mean, physically there's no bending, but I'm just showing a drawing that shows that the bands are bent so that they can match up, so that the energy levels can be shown properly proportioned to each other. So now I'm going to take this, I'm, I'm building on this idea. I'm going to put this junction to work. Now I'm going to expose it to light for the first time. Okay. So let's remember, this is the region where there's that electrostatic field. I'm kind of superimposing two ideas here, right? This is where the end type, the, phosph the phosphorus atoms, they lost their electrons. They went over here, fell in, got permanently stuck and created a field of negative here and where they left behind, they left behind positive charges in the crystal structure here. So here's that electrostatic field in that junction. So this is the PN junction. This is the P type. This is the N type. Okay. Now, let's put this in the sun. So I introduce a little electron down here in the valence band, just an electron around some silicon in the P type, and I expose it to some sunlight. Remember, it goes all the way through the N type. This is real thin. It actually, the light goes right on through. This is real thick. On a random basis, it hits these, this electron and boop. If it's got enough energy, if it's got 1.1 electron volts or more worth of energy in that photon, it can ionize that electron. And that's what happens, right? There's my whole electron pair creation. So now it hasn't physically moved left or right, but now that electron now is free. It's in the conduction band. It's able to move around. And here's the hole that was left behind. And so now, that electron hopefully wanders into that field and gets swept to the front. And notice what it did. It rolled down the hill. That's what people say. And I really don't like that because there's no hill. But the analogy would be like if there was a ball here and there was a hill in a gravitational field, the ball would be pulled in the gravitational field and would be moved forward down the hill by the gravitational field. And it would lose potential energy because it was falling down in the gravitational field. That's the analogy here. The electron falls into the electrostatic field and falls through the field, and in doing so, loses some of its potential energy because it's moved through the field. Basically, it's crashed into a bunch of objects there and moved through the electron, moves through the crystal structure. And don't forget that the hole can wander back the other way. So what I've done here is now I've taken the mechanical idea of that picture of the crystal structure with the electrons moving around, and I've combined it with this band gap picture as well.